Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Kfir, for organizing this. Thank you, Rabbi, for hosting us. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, we want to talk tonight about Purim, about the secrets of Purim. Uh, we're just about a month away from the holiday, and we know, generally speaking, the rule is that about a month before a holiday, 30 days before a holiday, you should start preparing for it. And tonight we want to go a little bit deeper. We want to go really into the secrets of Purim, things that uh, maybe you haven't heard before. Because the reality is that Purim is a very deeply mystical holiday. The whole thing is actually very deeply mystical and Kabbalistic and spiritual. The, the very text that we read itself, Megillah Tester, if you think about what it means, a Megillah literally means to reveal, right? Le Galot is, is a revelation, a Megillah. And Esther literally means hidden. Seter means hidden. And Megillah Tester literally means revealing what's hidden. God is not mentioned even once explicitly in the Megillah. We don't see God ever mentioned directly. And yet everything is concealed. And yet it's such a very deeply spiritual and mystical text. So we really want to go into what this means. You may have noticed that Megillah Tester also, anybody remember how many chapters it has? Megillah Tester. How many chapters in Megillah Tester? There's, there's 10 chapters. There's 10 chapters in Megillah Tester. And you can actually, if you know a little bit about the, f- the basics of, uh, of Kabbalah, of Jewish mysticism, and the whole concept of Sfirot, right? We have 10 <coughs> Sfirot. And the, you can go through the whole Megillah, each chapter, and you will find that each chapter very neatly corresponds to one of the 10 Sfirot from start to finish. If you know the terminology, Keter, Chochma, Bina, Chesed, Gvura, and you go through each chapter, and it mamash parallels the ten Sfirot. It's designed to parallel the ten Sfirot. And the Sfirot themselves are mentioned in the Megillah. It's one of the few books of Tanakh where all the, almost all the Sfirot are mentioned by name. Keter, and Hod, and Malchut, and Chesed, and all the terms are actually there, uh, which is unique. So if you go through the Megillah, you'll find many, many secrets. And we want to focus on one. There's one specific thing that I want to focus on tonight, which is actually a passage from the Gemara, okay, from the Talmud, from Masechet Megillah, which is all about Purim. And the passage begins with a phrase that you've all heard before. I'm sure you've all heard this before. And it goes like this. Amar Rava, Rava taught, Michayav inish levasume bepuria. Every person is supposed to, is obligated on Purim to levasume, which we have to explain what that means, but it's typically translated as to become intoxicated. How? Until what? Until what level? Ad deloyada, right? Ad deloyada, until the person does not know the difference Bain Aru Haman, that Haman is cursed, Levaruch Mordechai, and Mordechai is blessed. Yeah, we've all heard this before. You're supposed to get so intoxicated that you don't know the difference between Haman and Mordechai. That's how the passage begins, which sounds really wild. Like, how smashed do you have to be to not know the difference between the villain and the hero, between Arur and Baruch, between cursed and blessed between evil and good. Like that's a really high level of uh, being out of your mind. So how could this, what does this really mean? So we want to fo- break this down, this, this phrase. And then as it continues, the, the, it continues with a story which is maybe a little bit less well known. And the story is absolutely bizarre. So I'm going to read the story to you and then we're going to have to make sense of it because the pshat of the story doesn't make any sense. So this is the story. It says, the same Rava, the Rabbi Zeira, I should note here that in some versions of the text, it might say Rabba. And for those who have, who have studied Gemara before, Rava and Rabba are two different people. But uh, for those who know the, the, the people in the Gemara, I believe the proper reading here should be Rava, as we'll see, as we'll learn from other places, if you compare it to other places in the Gemara. Just as a side note for those who are familiar with, with Gemara learning, in case somebody asks me, why did you say Rava? In my text, I saw it said Rava. The proper reading, I believe, should be Rava here, and, and it'll become clear why. So anyway, Rava and Rabbi Zeira, it says, Avadu Saudat Purim. So one time they had a Purim feast together, and Ibasum. And again, that word, they became seemingly under the influence or intoxicated. 
and it continues and says, Come Rava and Shachte le Rabbi Zera. Rava arose and shechted Rabbi Zera. He shechted him. It's like he killed him. What? Like what's going on? Two rabbis are having a Purim feast together. And Rava seemingly, that seems to be the pshat, that he killed him. That makes no sense. What is going on here? He shechted him. And Lemachar, what happened the next day? Baye Rachame Vachaye. He prayed and he revived him. Rava resurrected Rabbi Zera. He brought him back to life in the morning. So it almost seems to be like they got super drunk. He woke up in the morning, Rava hung over, and saw Rabbi Zera dead and resurrected him. That seems to be the uh, inexplicable shot, the simple reading that, we're, that, that the Gemara is giving us. And the story continues and says, Leshana, the following year, Amarle, so one of them told the other, it's not clear who, Neiti Mar Venavit Sudat Purim, let's do it again, Behade Hadade, let's have another Sudat Purim the following year, let's do it again. It was such a great party last year, let's do it again. And Amarle, and the reply was, Lo Bechol Sha'ata Vesha'ata Mitrachish Nisa. Not every time is there a miracle. So it seems like, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think we're going to do this again when I died and had to be resurrected back to life. So that's the story. It's a short little passage. What does this mean? Right? Like, what does it mean when Rava taught that you should get so bisume, whatever that means, until you don't know the difference between Arur Aman and Baruch Mordechai. And then, seemingly, they get drunk, these two rabbis. One kills the other and then revives him. And then one of them says, hey, let's do it again. Why would you want to do that again? And the other one says, yeah, you know, maybe not this year. Let's, let's hold off this year. So let's explain the story. What's going on here? How could anybody, how could one rabbi kill anybody? I think all of us, even if we got extremely drunk, uh, we wouldn't get to the point where we actually like would kill somebody, God forbid. Doesn't make sense. So we have to really understand what's good. What is this word besume? Also, why does the, the, the Gemara use the word shecht? It says he shechted him. That, that's not typical language for the Gemara because in Aramaic, the word to usually to kill is not shecht. What's the word for killing? Anybody know in the Gemara? Katal, right? Katal. Katal is to kill in Aramaic. Usually when the Gemara says something about killing, the, the, the proper word is katal. And here it says shecht. He shechted him. That's also strange. So we want to explore these two words. What is besume and what is shecht and what is going on? So Rava is our main character here. And if we go to another place in the Gemara in Sanhedrin, it says something about Rava over there. Amar Rava, i ba'u baru alma. If the righteous want to, they can create worlds. The righteous can create whole worlds. And it gives a verse. How do we know? Shene'emar, there's a verse in Isaiah. And the verse in Ishayahu says, Ki im avonotechem ayu mavdilim b'enchem levena loechem, v'chatotechem istiru panim mikem. So basically the verse is saying that what separates you from Hashem is your sins. And if you don't have sins, nothing would separate you from Hashem. It's like you'd be one with God. And so based on that, Rav says, if you're a tzaddik and you have no sins, it's like you will be filled with divine power. Just like God can create worlds, you will be able to create worlds. And Rava was a huge mystic. We know from here and from other places that Rava was a huge mystic. And he had the power to create. The Gemara continues and says, the very next verse, Rava bara gavra. Another very famous phrase in the Gemara that Rava was able to create, almost created a, he created a golem. He was able to create a being somehow. Rava bara gavra. Some people say that's where abracadabra comes from. It sounds like abracadabra. It sounds very magical. The word abracadabra itself, some say the root of it is, is from Hebrew or Aramaic, evra kedibra. I will create as I speak. Because we know God spoke the universe into existence. And our speech has incredible power. In Hebrew, a, to speak, a word is a davar. And also a thing is a davar. Because everything that exists was brought into existence by God's word. Bidvar Hashem shamaim nasu. We say that in our prayers all the time. That through the word of God, everything came into existence. God spoke the universe into existence. What separates us from the rest of life on earth is that we are a medaber. That humans are able to communicate 
like God. So that word davar is really important, that we have the power to create through speech. And it seems like, so the uh, abracadabra comes from that root, evrakadibra, that I will create as I speak. And Rava was able to seemingly create this golem. And what did he do with the golem? Shadare lekame de Rabbi Zeira. So again, it's Rabbi Zeira. The same Rava and Rabbi Zeira that are in the first passage we quoted, he sent this golem as a messenger to Rabbi Zeira. And so Rabbi Zeira spoke to him, to this golem, and the golem couldn't reply. Because the golem can't speak. The golem has no soul. The golem is, is not a medaber like a human. We have this divine power to speak that God gave us. The golem doesn't. So it was just like a, a figure, you know, a, a lump of clay that, was, that he was able to animate. And Rabbi Zeira spoke to the golem and the golem couldn't reply. So Rabbi Zeira said, yeah, you're not real. Amar min chavraya at hadar leafrecha. So you, are, you were created by one of the sages. You're not real. Go back to the dust. That's what Rabbi Zeira told him. So this is a parallel passage to the first passage. Again, it's Rava and Rabbi Zeira. Here, Rava creates a golem. And Rabbi Zeira says, ah, you're not a real thing. You're just a, a magical, whatever, uh, an illusion. Go back to the dust. That's the other story. So we learn from this that Rava and, and Rabbi Zeira were actually great mystics. Okay? They had some incredible divine power. They were tzaddikim and that they were able to really use their speech in a, in a profoundly divine, powerful way. And we know from other places in the Talmud and the Zohar that these tzaddikim, especially back then, were able to elevate their souls. They were able to learn Torah on such a deep level and meditate upon the Torah so deeply that they were able to ascend to the heavens, right, which they called to the pardes, to the heavenly orchard. And you, you've, maybe some of you have heard of the famous story of Arba Shanichnesu Bepardes. You've heard of the story that there were four rabbis that around the same time, uh, maybe a generation or two earlier, that were able to go up to heaven. Right? And it's in Masachet Chagiga. It says, Tanu Rabbanan, Arba Nichnesu Bepardes. Four, four great sages were able to go up to heaven. And their names were, anybody remember their names? Who were? Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was the last. Who was... Other, who else? Elisha Acher. Acher, Elisha ben Avuya, who became Acher, who else? And two Shimons, Ben Zoma and Ben Azai. So Ben Azai u Ben Zoma, Acher, which is Elisha ben Avuya, ve Rabbi Akiva. So Amar lehem Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva told him, he gave them a little warning and he gave them a little advice. We'll skip that. And then what happened? Ben Azai het vamet. Ben Azai went up to the heavens, he saw this incredible vision. He beheld the, the divine presence, and he never came back. His soul just stayed up there. Vamet, hetzitz vamet. He never came back. And then Ben Zoma hetzitz venivga. He beheld the divine vision. He went up to heaven, and then he was injured. He was like mentally injured. And the Gemara later says that he was like up on the Temple Mount, and another rabbi saw him and said, hey, Ben Zuma, how's it going? You know, we haven't seen you in a while. And he says, hey, you know the difference between heaven and earth, between the upper waters and the lower waters? is just like a few finger breaths, you know? And the rabbi said, ah, Ben Zuma died b'chutz. He's still up there. He never really came back. And uh, the Gemara also tells us that he passed away shortly after that. And then, Acher, Kitzetz bin Tiot, he kind of left the path. He was so blown away by what he saw that he became a heretic, that he kind of he went off the derch. And only Rabbi Akiva, nichnas b'shalom ve'yatsa b'shalom, that he was able to come out in peace. So we know from this that the sages at the time were able to learn Torah on a very high level. And we know that Pardes itself stands for the four levels of how we're supposed to learn Torah. Pshat, the P of Pardes, the P is Pshat, which is a simple reading. And the Remez is the allusions and the kind of reading between the lines. And the Drash is the metaphorical and the analogies and the allegories. And finally, Samech is the Sod. So you have Pardes. Sod means the secret. So all together, you have Pardes. And really, we're all supposed to learn Torah on all four levels. Go as deep as we can. So that's what we're doing tonight. We read that story of Rabbi and Rabbi Zeir on the Pshat level. And we want to take it down to the Sod level. Like, what does that really mean? Because we are supposed to learn Torah on all four levels. And the Arizal, who was a great mystic himself, said that if you don't learn Torah on all four levels, then you haven't fulfilled the mitzvah of learning Torah even. He goes that far. And, and the Chida, 
said it a different way. He said, if you're only going to learn Pshat Remez Drash and you're not going to learn Sod, what's, gonna, what, what's the problem? The Pardes, if you take the Samech out of the Pardes, what are you left with? You're just left with Pered. So a Pered is a mule. So the Chida had that. I mean, they, they, took, they were mystics that they wanted to encourage people to learn more deeply. The idea is that the Pshat stories are important. You have to learn all four levels, right? Some people are only Sod. That's also not good. Right? Sephardis have that problem. Sometimes we do too much of the Sod. Uh, you know, they say that Sfarad, what's Sfarad? It's like Pardes. Samech Pei Reish Dalet, Sfarad. The Samech came first. The Sod came first. Before you even have the Pshat Remez Drash, you already have the Sod. So you don't want to be too much in the Sod, right? You still have to go in order. You have to do Pshat, Remez Drash, Sod. But the idea is that you can't go your whole life learning just Pshat. You know, we all go to shul every Shabbat. You read the weekly parsha. You know, you do that year after year after year. Each year, you should be going deeper, right? If you're always just reading the pshat, like we get it. You've been doing that since you were five years old. You've got to go deeper. So the idea is to go to the sod eventually, to work your way up to the sod. That's the meaning of pardes. So these four also went up. Rabbi Akiva and Elisha ben Avuya and ben Azai and ben Zoma, they were also great mystics, and they were able to go up to the heavenly realms to pardes. And so going back to Rabbi and Rabbi Zera, they were engaged in the same kind of thing. They were learning Torah on Purim on a very deep level. What they were trying to do is actually ascend to Pardes. And this is really the, the meaning of that story. Because if you look at the word Chayav Levasume, a person has to be Levasume. What is the root of that word of Besume? What does that mean? Beit Samech Mem. What does that mean? Bosem. What is a bosem? Bosem is like a fragrance. It's something aromatic. Bosem. It's the same root as in Hebrew as samim, which is drugs, because drugs are typically consumed that way. It's some kind of fragrant thing that people would ingest, you know, smoke or snort or whatever. It's the same origin. Sam, the word samim. Sam also means poison, though. Right? Some can also mean poison. Some can mean a potion. That same root, it can be an elixir, a potion, a poison, a drug, a fragrance, an aroma. It's all the same root of besamim, of samim. And so here is something really important. If you understand what is a bosem, and this is where what they were doing, chayav adam libsume, they were really using the Torah as their bosem. They were intoxicated, not by drugs, God forbid, because that's not what they would have. There's no way that Rava and Rabbi Zeir came and got intoxicated. Even halachically, that's a problem anyways. You're not supposed to ever get so under the influence. A Jew always has to be in control of himself. So that's not what they did. What they were doing is they were learning Torah. They were intoxicated with Torah. And how do we know? Because the Torah itself is called a bosem or a sum. It says in Masechet Kiddushin, in another place in the Gemara, Tanu Rabbanan, why does it mean when we say, V'samtem et dvarai elle alevavchem? Right? We say that all the time in our prayers in the Shema. V'samtem. What does that mean, samtem? The Gemara says, Tanu Rabbanan, V'samtem, sam tam. The Torah is a sam tam. Sam is that drug. And tam means pure. The Torah is your pure drug. Nimshela Torah kesam chaim. That the Torah itself is like an elixir of life, like sam chaim. It's this fragrant aroma. The Torah itself is like a drug. And the Torah should be your drug and not some other recreational substances. And the passage continues and says, Kacha kadosh baruch hu amar laem leisrael, Banai, my children, barati yetzer ara, God told the people of Israel, I created the evil inclination, and I also created the Torah as its spice, as its fragrance, as its uh, cure, as the medicine. I created the Yetzirah and I created the Torah as the antidote for the Yetzirah. The Torah is that drug that cures you from the Yetzirah. That's what it says. And if you engage in Torah learning, then you will not fall to the evil inclination. The Torah is your drug. Right? That's the only drug that you need. Also listen to your doctor and take whatever medications you need. But the Torah is the drug for your soul. And that's the idea. 
So why is the Torah compared to a drug, to something aromatic, something fragrant? What does that have? How did how do we get here? Why the analogy to something that smells or something that's consumed through the nose, something like a drug, like a fragrance? Where does that come from? And this brings us right back to the Megillah, because the one of the themes of the Megillah, one of the secrets of Purim that you'll miss. You can read the Megillah a hundred times, and you might miss this throughout the whole Megillah. One of the key themes is smell, is scent. Where do we see scent and smell in the Megillah? That's right. Esther's real name. What does the, the Megillah say? What was her real name? Mordechai vi omen et hadasa. He, Esther, that Mordechai was the step or the foster father of, he raised Hadassah. He has said, what's her real name? Esther was not her real name. Esther was her secular name. Like a lot of people have today, two names. Her Jewish name, her Hebrew name, was Hadassah. Esther was the local Babylonian name. Hadassah was her real Jewish name. And what's a Hadass? Hadass is the myrtle branches that smell nice, that we make brachas on in the Lulav, and in the Bet Knesset, many shuls have a Hadassim on Shabbat. So Hadassim, it's an ancient tradition for Jews to have Hadassim on Shabbat, because they smell nice, and you make a, a bracha on them. Right? So Hadassah, is a fra- her real name, Esther's real name is Hadas, this fragrant uh, tree. Right? Where else do we see? In the preparations. In the preparations, that's right. What, do we, what does it say about the preparations? It says that they, the women, before they would go before the king, what did they have to do? Before each of the young maidens would go to the king, that they would be put under fragrant spices. They would be put in baths of myrrh for six months. And again, that word, they'll be put for six months in other fragrant spices. Before they could see the king, they had to be put in fragrances for a year. They were bathed in six months, six months of bathing in myrrh, six months of bathing in other fragrances. Why does that, why is that even important to mention that? Like, who cares that all the ladies before they went to the, to the king had to immerse themselves in fragrances for an entire year and Esther as well. Where else do we see fragrances? Good fragrances or bad fragrances? Well, maybe both. Do you see bad fragrances? The garbage gets thrown on Haman. True. Haman gets uh, garbage on him. What about Mordechai? We said Esther. Her real name's Hadassah. What's Mordechai's real name? Anybody know? Yeah. But, and what was his real name? Anybody know what's Mordechai's real name? The Mishnah says what's, Mordechai was also not his name. Esther and Mordechai, ironically enough, you know, the Megillah is all irony. And Esther and Mordechai have very non-Jewish names. Esther is connected to Ishtar, right? Like one of the goddesses at that time. And Mordechai is connected to Marduk, one of the Babylonian gods. So those were not their Jewish names. Uh, the Mishnah says Mordechai's real name was Petachia. That was his Jewish name, Petachia. And then the Gemara asks in Masechet Chulin, how do we know? Where do we see Mordechai alluded to in the Torah itself? Where it says, like the rabbi said in Exodus chapter 30, Mordro, this phrase, that there shall be uh, pure myrrh, and umetargaminan, and we translate that, the Aramaic translation in the Targum is Mara Dechia or Mira Dechia. Right? That's a, an allusion to Mordechai. Where do we see, the, the sages say, where do we see Mordechai in the Torah? Where it says myrrh, you have to use pure myrrh. Myrrh is this fragrant spice. Right? So Mordechai's name comes from Mo, the myrrh. Esther is Hadassah, the fragrant branch. What about Haman? The same Gemara asks, where do we see Haman? Haman mina Torah minayin. Where do we see Haman in the Torah? Hamin, that's right. Where it says in the Garden of Eden, Hamin Ha'etz Azeh, right? That the, the, the Nachash in the Garden of Eden. So the sages say that word Hamin, with, if you change the Nikud, it's the same letter, spells Haman. So the sages say, where do you find Haman alluded to in the Torah itself? From Hamin Ha'etz, 
from the tree when the Nachash spoke to Eve and enticed her to eat from the tree of knowledge. And here is the key to solving the whole puzzle of this whole smell thing. What is so important about scent? Why is the Torah compared to a spice? Right? Why is the Megillah so full of spices and fragrances? What is so special about drugs even and medications that they are called Samim, the Samim, that they heal us? Why, why is that? Why did God create such a world where Tavlinim, where these fragrant things are like medicines that, we can, that you can consume and heal yourself? What is the healing power of medicine? What is the ability of even recreational drugs, which we hope to avoid, which is like a shortcut some people take for elevation? But why does that exist? Why did God make recreational drugs? Why do the, such chemical substances exist? Why do such fragrances exist that can elevate you and give you this out-of-body experience? So the key is right here in Hamina Etzazeh. Because the mystics say something really amazing. The Arizal and the Kabbalists say something really amazing. What happened in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve when they consumed from the forbidden fruit? How did they consume from the forbidden fruit? They heard the Nachash who enticed them. They listened to the advice of the Nachash. They saw, it says, the Torah says, they saw the tree that it was good for eating. It says they saw the tree and they were enticed by that. They tasted it. Right? They touched it, obviously. They plucked it off the tree and they tasted it. But nowhere does it say that they smelled it. They never smelled the fruit. So the Kabbalists say something amazing. They say the only sense of the five major human senses that was not contaminated by the sin of the forbidden fruit is the sense of smell. The sense of smell remained pure. All the other senses were used in that mistake of the forbidden fruit, and therefore all those senses became contaminated. And all those senses have etz da'at tov vera, right? What does etz da'at tov vera mean? Da'at means knowledge, but on a deeper level, da'at means unification, to bring things together. Etz da'at tov vera means it's the unification of good and evil, of mixing things together. So with all other senses, there was all this good and evil mixed into it, and it became contaminated. But the sense of smell was not contaminated. It remained pure. And there's a direct channel using the sense of smell to the heavens. And that's why we see through, henceforth in the Torah, constantly, you'll miss this. You'll read the Torah a thousand times and you'll miss this. But one of the most common things that we read over and over and over again in the Torah, most, much of the Torah is made up with sacrifices. And what does it say with the sacrifices? Starting with Noah and throughout the, the, throughout the whole five books of the Torah, all the way to Dvarim, it says you bring an offering. Why? Reach nechoach le'ashem. What? It's a pleasant fragrance for God. And that refrain, you see it throughout the Torah, over and over and over. It's one of the most common phrases in the Torah. Reach nechoach le'ashem. Reach nechoach le'ashem. Reach nechoach le'ashem. Right? It's like, does God smell? Of course not. Nothing, God doesn't smell. But the idea of the fragrance of the sacrifice, that's what, was, that's what did the whole tikkun, the whole rectification of the sacrifice, was not the sacrifice itself, but it was the fragrance, because that's what remains pure and uncontaminated and connects that sense, has so much power, and connects heaven and earth. And what was the greatest mitzvah in the whole Torah? What was the holiest mitzvah, the greatest thing that a Jew could ever perform, the holiest service on the Jewish calendar, in temple times, on Yom Kippur, what was the main service of Yom Kippur? Ketoret. Was when the Ketoret, right? When the Kohen Gadol once a year would take the Ketoret, the incense, the special mixture of incense, which had myrrh in it as well, and he would go into the Holy of Holies, and the smoke of the incense would fill the Holy of Holies, and he would breathe it in, and he would see a vision of God. And that was the climax of Yom Kippur. And again, it's all about smell. And through the sense of smell, the Kohen Gadol would be able to see God and then affect uh, uh, atonement for the entire nation. And then he would come out and he would be like this holy person. And people would see like rainbows and lightning. And, uh, you know, we all know from the Yom Kippur service, right? When the Kohen would come out of the, the Holy of Holies, that was the climax of the whole Yom Kippur service was, all, again, all about smell, right? all about scent. And by the way, in the Megillah, it's the same. Because right at the, how does the Megillah begin? 
it says that Achashverosh threw a party. And what do our sages say about that party? What did Achashverosh do at that party? He dressed like the Kohen Gadol. Do you remember this? He specifically dressed like the Kohen Gadol and tried to mimic that Ketoret procedure, what the Kohen Gadol would do once a year on the holiest day of the year. So Achashverosh was trying to, and that's also why we, we, you know, we get dressed. You'll notice the whole idea of costumes is throughout the Megillah. People are dressing up. Mordechai is dressed up like the king, and Achashverosh is dressed up like the Kohen Gadol. Everybody is dressing up as something that they're really not, and Esther is dressed up like a queen, and there's all this dressing up going on. And it's one of the amazing things in Hebrew, as just as a quick aside. How do you say to get, dre- to get dressed up in a costume in Hebrew? Tachposet. And the verb is le'it chapes. Now think about that for a second. What does that mean, le'it chapes? You know, le'it, any Hebrew, if you know like Hebrew grammar, anytime you have a Hebrew verb with le'it, what does that mean? Reflexive. It's reflexive. It means you do it to yourself, right? So le'it labesh means to dress yourself. Right, leit rachetz, whatever. Anytime you add lehit, it means I'm doing it to myself. So what does that mean, lehit chapes? Right, because if you take the lehit out and it's not reflexive anymore, what do you get left? What's left? Lechapes, right? To search. So leit chapes literally is like to search for yourself, right? To find yourself. Right? Who are you really? We all put on costumes every day, right? You have one costume at work, one costume at home, one costume when you're with your buddies, one costume with your spouse. Everybody puts on costumes, you know? Like Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage, and we're always just, we're like actors putting on different costumes. So what does that really mean to dress up as a costume? A costume very much often times just reveals what you want deep inside, you know? Like a chashverosh dressing up like... Uh, a Kohen Gadol and Haman wanting to be dressed up like the king, but then Mordechai gets dressed up like the king. So there's a lot of very interesting psychology over there of what it means to put on a costume, right? Le'it chapes, which is really just means to search for yourself, to find out, like, who are you really, right? Which of these personas that you put on every day, who is the real you? Which of those costumes is you? So that's that. So the Ketoret itself was, had this incredible spiritual upliftment in the Kodesh Kodeshim, that the, the sages say that the, the Kohen Gadol specifically had to smell it. It had to fill the whole, the smoke of the Ketoret had to fill. Kitor literally means a smoke, a vapor. So Ketoret literally means that the, the, he had to breathe that vapor, and then he would see a vision of God. And to connect it scientifically, I'm putting my science hat on now, because I, I majored in, in biology and biochemistry. So actually I did research in epigenetics, which I want to get to, but scientifically there's something really amazing here because how many genes do you have? Anybody know how many, you know, your DNA codes for your physical characteristics, right? How many genes do you think codes for you, your skin and your eyes and your hair and your nails and your proteins and your liver and whatever, everything in your body? How many genes do you have? Anybody know? Guess, throw a number. How many genes do you think, how many traits do you think you need to code for your physical uh, being? Guess. No wrong. There is a wrong answer, but just guess. 23? 23 chromosomes, pairs of chromosomes. But how many genes? 32. No, you need more than that. Think about how many traits you have in your body. So they used to think, originally they used to think that it was probably going to be something like 100 to 300,000. That's what scientists were estimating. And then when the Human Genome Project was completed, started in 1989, was finished by 2000, the first draft, when we actually sequenced the human genome and went through it, they found only 22,000 genes roughly. That's it. 22,000 genes that code for your entire physical body, all your proteins and things like that. But what's really amazing is once we started to figure out what these genes do and categorize them, the largest gene family, you know, you have families of genes. You have a set of genes that codes for your muscles. You have a set of genes that codes for vision, for all the visual proteins and things. You have sets of genes for everything in your body. The largest gene family, it's about a thousand genes. Guess what it codes for? Smell. Just your sense of smell. The largest gene family in your body Fun fact is to code for smell. And it's something so tiny. 
It's one of the smallest organs in your body. In your brain, the olfactory bulb, which processes scent, is tiny. It's like a little, tiny little thing, like a, an M&M at the base of your brain. That's it. Your brain has huge sections for like visual processing, you know, the whole like back, ha- back part of your brain, you have a whole, oxid- a whole lobe just for vision. You know, you have whole areas for movement, for other senses. But for smelling, it's a tiny little thing, like a little peanut at the base of your brain. That's the whole olfactory bulb. And what's even more amazing, and this connects to what the Kabbalists say about the sense of smell, but in a physical manifestation, because we know everything in the physical world is only a reflection of the spiritual world. And just as spiritually, the sense of smell is direct heaven and earth, in the sense of smell, it's the only sense that goes directly from your nose into your brain. Straight. All the other ner- senses go through a variety of nerves. Like to go from your eyes to the occipital lobe in your brain, there's about seven layers of ner- neurons. So what, the message gets relayed one to the other, to the other, to the other, goes through the thalamus, gets processed. Smell is the only sense that just goes straight to your brain. Nothing in between. Direct connection from your nose to your brain. That's why sometimes people, they operate on the brain. They go through, right through the nose. The nose goes directly right to the brain. And so the biggest gene family is uh, for smell. Right? And we, scientifically, smell is so powerful, it's so profound, and it's connected really closely with our memories. The greatest connection between memory and a sense is actually smell. So you don't remember a lot of what you see, you don't remember a lot of what you hear, but you remember almost everything you smell. And you may have noticed this, you know, sometimes you'll smell something that you haven't smelled in 30 years, 40, 50 years. You smell something and that takes you back to like your grandmother's cookies in her kitchen when you were a kid, right? You never forget smells and it takes you right back. I always have this with watermelon. I always, like my wife and I, we have this like running joke. Every time I cut a watermelon and that scent comes out of it, it like takes me back to the beach in Tel Aviv where we always used to have watermelon, you know. And we, as a kid, we would go to the beach and have watermelon and always like transports me back, you know, whatever, to 30 years ago when, when that happened. So, and I'm sure you all have your thing, that smell that just like takes you back, that teleports you to another time and place. So smell is really that powerful. And that's why also drugs are so powerful. Fragrances, people smelling a particular scent can elevate them and take them to other worlds or whatever, or make their minds go whack. You know? So all of that is just from the sense of smell. And we don't even realize how important a role smell plays. Today we know about pheromones. You know, we think, sometimes you think you, you choose your spouse, but so much of that, scientists did this amazing experiment where they took a bunch of um, guys and they took their pictures and they had girls rank the guys based on how attractive they think the guys are. And then they took the, the same guys and they had them exercise, get sweaty, and they took their t-shirts, their sweaty t-shirts, and they told the girls to smell these nasty t-shirts and said rank them based on their attractiveness by the smell. And guess what happened? It matched. What they thought visually was appealing was also what the, the sweat that they thought smelled all right, that they were attracted to. Yeah. So we don't even realize like the, the hidden sense, the pheromones, that even in interacting with other people, we, we very much smell each other and there's all this like subconscious activity going on. And even in choosing a partner for life, you think somebody is like visually appealing, but it's often not even the visual. It's often the smell that appeals to you. And it's like, it's all subconscious. It's all like pheromones. So just from a scientific perspective as well, that, sm- that smell is so powerful. And so our, we, we don't give much credit to our nose. And you know, God is called, in the Torah, you'll notice there's a lot of anthropomorphisms that God is described in human terms. And again, one of the most frequent is we say that God is, and it's in our prayers, God is erech hapaim. Erech hapaim. God has big nostrils. God has a long nose, right? Arich also in Kabbalistic terminology. The long face or the long nose, right? Or God will say, chara api that my, which means God gets angry, he says, chara api, metaphorically, which literally means my nostrils will flare, right? that association of God's nose. So God is called the long-nosed one, that he's erech that he's very patient, he's long-suffering, that he's long-nosed. 
Some people say that's why Jews tend to have bigger noses. I don't know. But because we're, we're mirroring God. Uh, we are like trying to be like em- emulating God in this world. So that even there, we see that connection to the smell. And, and to finally, I mean, to, to our time, we're all expecting Mashiach. We're all expecting Geula. And what does it say about Mashiach? The Gemara says something amazing in Sanhedrin. It says, Isaiah describes, Ishayahu describes Mashiach as, Benachalav Ruach Hashem, the Spirit of God will rest upon him, Ruach Chochma Ubina, wisdom, understanding, Ruach Etza Ugvura, and counsel and strength, Ruach Dat, and he will have knowledge, Veirat Hashem, and the fear of God. And then Isaiah continues in the next verse and says, Ve'aricho Beirat Hashem. Ve'aricho Beirat Hashem. And the Gemara says, What does that mean, Ve'aricho Beirat Hashem? That he will smell with the fear of God? That's what Isaiah seems to be saying. And guess who is here? Rava, the same Rava, which we have to go back to. Don't forget Rava and Rabbi Zera. We're coming back to that. The same Rava says, Rava Amar, the Morach Vedain, that Mashiach smells and judges. How do we know? Because Isaiah himself says, that Mashiach will not judge by what he sees or by what he hears. So how will he judge? By what he smells. That Mashiach will smell and judge. That's what it says. And it even tells a little passage. You remember Bar Kochva, Shimon Bar Kochva, the guy who claimed to be Mashiach, not that guy, a different guy, who claimed to be Mashiach 1800, 1900 years ago. There was the Bar Kochva revolt. And many people at the time believed he was Mashiach. Even Rabbi Akiva thought that maybe he's Mashiach or that he was the presumptive Messiah. He managed to defeat the Romans temporarily, kick them out of Israel, started rebuilding the temple. Ultimately, he lost, though. And the Gemara says this, Bar Koziva Malach Tartin Shanin, that Bar Koziva ruled Israel for two and a half years. And what the rabbis wanted to know if he's really Mashiach or not. So what do you think they did? Amar lo le Rabbanan, Anna Mashiach. He said, I am Mashiach. So they told him, Amru le, the Mashiach ktiv, the Morach vedain. It says about Mashiach that he will smell and judge. So what did they do? They checked if he could smell and judge, and he couldn't. So they said, you're not Mashiach. <laughs> That's what the Gemara says here. And it says, shortly after he died, Katluhu. So again, the word Katal. He was killed by the Romans. And the word Katal is used here. Uh, that he was killed by the Romans shortly after that. So how did they test him? You think you're Mashiach? Show us your fantastic sense of smell. And maybe he had COVID, he couldn't smell. So he couldn't. Is there any reference to smell when it comes to us, you know? It's a good question. Yes, there is, because it says that Har Sinai bloomed with fragrant flowers when the Torah was given. That's why there's an old custom to decorate uh, the shul with flowers on Shavuot. Actually, there's some Bukharians in the audience. The Bukharian name for the holiday of Shavuot is, comes from the word for flowers, gulisurch, which is like the flowers of the... Because they, they used to be accustomed to decorate the synagogue with flowers. So yes, there is. That the, that the mountain was fragrant, absolutely. Actually, over there also, it says that ha'al kulo, ashan kulo, that the whole mountain was like, uh, was like smoke. Was like, the whole mountain was like ketoret. And the Kabbalists say on that, now you got me on a tangent, but the Kabbalists say on that, that Ashan, what does Ashan mean? It's Olam Shana Nefesh, that the universe, Olam, and time, Shana, and soul, all were united in one. So again, to add to that, the smoke of Har Sinai connecting the heavens to the earth. So, yeah, totally. So, what does this mean for us with Mashiach coming and having this powerful sense of smell. And I said COVID, I joked, but also it's interesting that COVID manifested itself as people not being able to smell. And there's a, there is something deep, a deeper connection here because the sages also tell us that the generation of Mashiach, it's a very famous line, many of you have heard it, in Masachet Sota, it describes what the world will be like when Mashiach comes. It describes that generation. And one of the interesting descriptions that it uses is Pnei Hador, Kepnei Hakelev. The generation will be like dogs. So we know, we can see morally how that reflects itself today with what's going on in the world and the internet and the TikTok and the Instagram and the, all the, I'm not going to get into all the things that happen in the world and all the immorality that's being pushed through the media and all that stuff. But we can definitely see the dog-like nature of people really debasing themselves and behaving in a very 
dog-like way, right? So for the sages, a dog was always a symbol of something that's very hypersexual, to put it uh, more gently, some, you know, uncontrolled. And Exactly. Exactly. But, and that's what I was getting to, on the one hand, the sages use that negatively, saying, The generation is like a generation of dogs. But the main feature of a dog is that it has an incredible sense of smell, right? Perhaps the best. A dog can smell things. A dog can smell its owner coming home before he's, you know, he's still a mile away, and they can already sense somehow these incredible things. You know, we all know. So the, the airport dogs can smell from hundreds of, uh, of meters away, something that's locked up in a suitcase and a bag and they can already smell it. So they've trained dogs to smell cancer. A dog can smell a tumor. They have dogs today that can sense blood sugar. A diabetic kid, so to measure the blood sugar, instead of always pricking and getting a blood thing, the, the dog can smell the kid's blood sugar. Wow. Yeah, from the breath. What is that? He doesn't know how much. It's so pers- the dog's nose is so sensitive that the dog can smell on the breath of the child the sugar levels. Can you believe that? You can look this up. It's unbelievable. They've trained dogs to do all kinds of things, to detect tuberculosis and like everything, tumors and glucose and unbelievable. So the dog's sense of smell is something amazing. And I, and I think that that connects to our generation because something that we take for granted is that we, we are the first generation in history, like in the last hundred years, where life smells pleasant. I think we forget that in past times, things stunk all the time because there was animals everywhere. There was no sewer systems, right? There were no toilets, no plumbing. People, even my parents, when they were growing up, they didn't have plumbing. They went in Uzbekistan, they went to the bathroom outside. No right? And no sh- Yeah, they, to go shower, they had to go to the public bathhouse. Right? That's how my parents grew up. And in most of the world, that's how it was until recently. No, no sewers, no plumbing. You know, you, there was waste was thrown on the street. There was animal you know, manure all over the place. Things didn't smell nice. People didn't have all these perfumes that we have today and fragrances. and That was really expensive. That was for Achashverosh and his, you know, his harem to have all these spices and to anoint. And that's why the women were spent a year bathing. Why did they need a year to bathe in, in fragrant spices and, and aromas before meeting the king? That's how badly it stunk that they needed a year to get rid of it all. So we tend to forget that, that in ancient times, things were pretty stinky outside, right? Like we are the first generation where things smell nice and we are very sensitive to negative smells, right? Back then, people wouldn't have even batted an eye to this because smell was just bad all the time and it wasn't even, you didn't even notice it. But today, we are a generation that's extremely sensitive with smell, all of us. All right, so this is very much in line with the idea of the, the generation of Mashiach, of Mashiach smelling and judging. And we are all like that. We judge through our sense of smell today. We have a very sensitive scent that never in history existed before. So that's, that theme, going back to Purim, that's the theme that you see that throughout this whole idea of aromas. And when you read the Megillah, Bezrat Hashem, very soon, you will go through it and you'll notice throughout all these allusions to smell. So to finish, to go back to Rava and put it all together. So Rava says that a person chayav libesume. And what did he mean? Did he mean that you have to get intoxicated? So hopefully now we understand that bosem, that's not what, what he meant. Because the Torah is called a bosem. The Torah is what you should be intoxicated with. And through Torah, you can elevate yourself. Like the hype, like the Kohen Gadol and the Beit HaMikdash, you can elevate yourself up to the heavens, to enter Pardes. And that idea of smell being so timeless and so infinite, connecting you across time and place and the power of smell. That's what Rebbe was really saying, the connection. And uh, we even receive, this is another thing, I, I said I would re- reference this. I did research in epigenetics when I was in university. So scientists discovered something amazing. They trained our, um, a rat to be, they exposed it to cherry, the smell of cherries. And every time they exposed the rat to cherries, they zapped the rat with some electricity. So what do you think happened? The rat became scared of the cherry smell. Every time it smells cherries, it like panics and runs away because it fears that it's going to get zapped. 
Then they had the rat mate, and they took the babies, never exposed to any chair, nothing. And they gave the rat, the baby rats, they removed from the mother. They didn't know the mother, they didn't know the, And they exposed the baby rats to cherry smell. Guess what happens? They start running away, they start panicking. So scientists were blown away. So how is that possible? They didn't know the mother. The mother didn't teach it to them. How did that happen? So that was one of the amazing experiments in epigenetics, that our genetics is not what all, just what we think, just hard genes in our, in our code. We actually pick up information, and that affects how our genes are, tra- are expressed. And there's more information above the genome. It's called the epigenome that also gets inherited. So now we have evidence that we also inherit memories, especially memories of smell, like they did with that cherry blossom, right? So we even, you're born with certain memories, an amazing thing. That's something to, to keep in mind. It's in our DNA, going all the way back to what sense do we have in our DNA, going all the way back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And you'll notice that the Garden of Eden, anybody know what the Garden of Eden smelled like? Etrog, no? So etrog, some say, was the, the tree, yes. But what did the whole garden smell like? A pardes of tapuchim, right? A chakal tapuchim. So we read that, Rashi says that when Yaakov came to take the blessing from uh, Itzhak, Itzhak says that he smelled him uh, the smell of my son, when he walked in, remember, it didn't smell so nice back then. So suddenly he smells the garden of Eden, a blessed garden. And Rashi says, what does Rashi says, say here? Rashi says what we said earlier, like it would have stunk like goats. Like Yaakov had goat, on, goat skins on him. Right? So Rashi is saying it would have stunk. Like, what does this mean that it smelled like a garden? <laughs> that when Yaakov walked in, the smell of the Garden of Eden walked in with him. And Yitzhak was blown away by that. And Rashi continues and says, What is this reach sadeh asher bercho Hashem? What is a field that God blessed? It was like, what is the scent of the Garden of Eden? Zeu sadeh tapuchim. It's the smell of an apple orchard. And this idea of a chakal tapuchin, of an apple orchard, is found throughout mystical literature. You have it, I see you guys have Chabad Sidurs here. So in the Chabad Sidur, like during Seudah Shlishit, also you read, it says there's chakal tapuchin. You'll notice that, 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 ver, that phrase that we want to, especially during Seudah Shlishit on Shabbat, it says to rise to that level, to enter the apple orchard, the chakal tapuchin, to, again, elevate our bodies heavenward and have that, kind of spiritual out-of-body experience, and ex- to feel, to experience the Shekhinah. So that's the whole idea of Chakal Tapuchin, of, of an apple orchard. So that's what Rava was saying. Rava was saying, we want to get intoxicated by Torah so that we can enter that, the apple orchard. We want to go up to the heavens. We want to enter Pardes. That's what they were really doing. They were going up to Pardes, like many sages at the time did. The Zohar has a parallel passage and says Rabbi Chia and Rabbi Yitzhak did the same and they went to Pardes and over there it says how did they do it? They smelled Shoshanim, they smelled roses and that was their way to go up to heaven through again through the sense of smell and Shoshanim also in the Megillah and what do you always notice the Megillah keeps saying over and over again? The events happen in Shushan Abira. Why does it keep saying that? We get it. All you had to do was say at the beginning, this happened in Shushan Abira. But it keeps saying, Shushan Abira, Shushan Abira, Shushan Abira. Why? Who cares? It was in Shushan, the capital. Why is that important? The Zohar begins, the first page of the Zohar, the introduction of the Zohar, is all about the rose of creation, the Shoshana of Bria, Shushan Habira and Shoshana Bria. There, it's like an anagram. Yeah? The letters are in. So that's really what Megillah Tester is telling you, to look deeper. We're talking about the rose of creation, the rose that, the smell, the scent of the rose that the sages used to ascend to the heavens. And if you like Gimatria also, um, Shoshana, the Gimatria of Shoshana is 661, which is the Gimatria of Esther. Esther is 661. So we always, there's this theme of a Shoshana. When we finish the Megillah, what do we sing? Shoshana Diakov. Right? What, what does that have to do with anything? Shoshana Diakov. Shoshana Diakov is Esther. And Shoshana is 661 like Esther, if you like Gimatria. And that's really what Rava was saying, to go back to Rava. 
Because Rava was saying you have to go so deep in your Torah that you don't know the difference between Arur Aman and Baruch Mordechai. What, is, what does that mean? I don't know the difference between good and evil? That's impossible. What did he really mean? Do the gematria of Arur Aman. Aleph, Reish, Vav, Reish. I'll spare you the trouble. It's late. Probably can't do the numbers now. Arur Aman is 502. Baruch Mordechai added up. Beit, Reish, right? 502. Arur Aman in gematria and, five, and Baruch Mordechai in gematria, same. But they're both 502. That's what Rava was saying. He, he wasn't saying you won't know the difference between good and evil. That's impossible. What Rava was saying is, Hayav libsume, you should get so intoxicated with Torah that you're reading it not on a pshat level. You're not reading the Megillah on a pshat level. You're reading the Megillah on a sod level where you're looking at codes and gematrias. And then you'll notice that the gematria of Aru Aman and Baruch Mordechai is the same. It's 502. That's why you can't tell the difference between them. On the sod level, it's the same value. Why is it the same value? Because the, the energy of Baruch neutralizes the energy of Haman. More than that, our sages say that there's a secret hero in Megillah Tester. And we say it at the end of the Megillah. Who was the secret hero in Megillah Tester? His name was Hatach. Hatach was the attendant of Esther. He was the messenger. He was the one that was communicating between Esther and Mordechai. And he was one of the heroes. Who is Hatach? The Gemara says Hatach is Daniel. Because where is Daniel in the whole story? We know Daniel worked in the palace. Where is he? The sages say Hatach is Daniel. And you do the gematria of Daniel. Dalet Nun Yud Aleph Lamed, 95. Haman He Mem Nun, 95. Daniel neutralizes Haman. You see the same pattern over and over again. With Mashiach and Nacha, we said Mashiach, smells. And Mashiach Gimatria is 358. Mem Shin Yud Chet. The Nachash, Nun Chet Shin, 358. Right? That same force, the Nachash, who enticed Adam and Eve and got them kicked out of the garden. 358. Mashiach, who's supposed to come and neutralize the Nachash and bring the world back to the Garden of Eden, 358. So you see these numbered balances like math. It's a perfect equation. This balances this. This cancels out this. That's what Rava was saying. Start reading the Torah on a deeper level where you see what's really going on on the Sod level. That's what's Hayav Adam Lipsume. And that's why, to go back to our first question, why it says, Kam Rava and Shachte, he shechted Rabbi Zeira. Why does it say he shechted him? He didn't, like, it didn't say Katal, it didn't say he killed him. He what is the point of shechting an animal? When you shech the, the idea is to elevate its soul, right? You're not allowed to just kill an animal, but, if, but to shech it means that you do it in a specific procedure with, in a specific way to elevate the soul of that animal to restore it up to the heavens. You're rectifying, in a sense, the animal, doing a tikkun for it. So shechting is not killing. Shechting is freeing the soul of the animal so that it can ascend back to heaven. So what Rava did was he shechted Rabbi Zeira, which means the Torah was so deep that Rabbi Zeira's soul elevated up to the heavens. That's what they were doing. They went up to Pardes. And so then what happened? He woke up in the morning and he said, what happened to Rabbi Zeira? The same thing that happened to Ben Azai. Remember what happened to Ben Azai? At Sitz Vamet. He went up and he never came back. He liked it up there. That's what happened to Rabbi Zeira. He went up and he stayed there. So Rabbi said, oh my gosh, I forgot Rabbi Zera up there. I got to bring him back. So he brought him back to this world, brought him back to life. And then when you look at the final sentence of the passage, it doesn't say who's speaking, but it says the following year, Lashana Amarle. He said to him, who said to who? So we think it means Rava told Rabbi Zera, hey, come, let's do a party again. And Rabbi Zera said, no, you know what? I kind of died last year, so... Let's not do it this year. But actually, you can read it the exact opposite way. You can read that it's Rabbi Zeira that told Rava, hey, last year was amazing. Let's do it again. And Rava said, I don't know if I can bring you back to life again, right? I don't know if we can have another miracle. You might stay there this time, and I don't want responsibility for that. That's the other way to read it, and many read it that way, that it's actually Rava that refused because... Rabbi Zeira had a great time, but he almost didn't make it. And Rabbi didn't want the responsibility of not being able to bring him back. 
So to conclude, the idea of Purim is again, Megillat Esther, it's revealing the hidden. It's about going deeper beyond the simple story. Seems, seems very simplistic and childish, you know, like this little, people are putting on costumes and it's like all irony and it's humorous and, you know, it seems like a child's. People think of Purim as a children's holiday, but it's so much deeper than that. Right? And that's what Rava and Rabbi Zeir are saying. Right? You have to go chayav adam libsume. You have to be intoxicated by the Torah. Not with drugs. We don't need drugs. Right? The Torah is our drug. Or That's what I mean. I, I consider alcohol a drug too. Without any chemical substances, which has gotten out of hand in, the, in some places, unfortunately, in the Jewish world, that there's too much you know, drinking and this and that. And that's not really the point. And the idea is to be intoxicated by Torah and to go much deeper into the text and to reveal the secrets because that's what Megillat Estel means, to see the codes, to see the gematrias, to see how this beautiful tapestry that God weaves in the story, that God is not explicitly there, but God is really there every step of the way. Right? God is in every chapter. God is in every sentence. So it's about uncovering the real mysteries of the Torah. And that's really what's going to bring Yehula. We all want Mashiach. We all want a better world. We all want all this anti-Semitism and all this violence and war to end. And when is it going to end? The Zohar itself says that it's going to end when the, whole, when the Jewish people start going deeper into the Torah, when these, the wellsprings of this mystical knowledge spreads around the world and people start looking at taking the Torah seriously, not as a book of trivial stories, but as the, the whole code the fabric that, that codes for the fabric of the universe, right? This is what the Torah is. This is what's going to bring Yehula. So I want to end with, with that message that this year on Purim, may we really go deeper into the Megillah and uncover its true secrets, and may we see Mashiach and the Geula soon. Amen. Thank you very much. On behalf, certainly of myself and I'm sure of everybody else, I would like to thank Ephraim very, very much for a most insightful, meaningful, profound uh, hour that we spent with you. I personally believe, as I was listening to you, it took me back to my yeshiva days, actually, and I was thinking, that's what it's going to be like when Mashiach comes. We're going to be able to gather together to hear and learn this kind of information, the deeper insight of life. Everything's going to be much richer, more vivid. We'll smell better then, too. Right. So uh, we're that's going to right. hear better, smell better, that's see right. better, hopefully. And everything will have much more vivid color and meaning to it, to life. And Purim is a totally different Purim now, the way you've explained it to us. So I'd like thank to thank you very, very much. Thank you. It's, it's been a great, uh, uplifting experience for us, <laughs> yes. And it'd be hard to come down to earth again, but thank you very much. <laughs>